Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1,402. If somebody made it, somebody can fix it or somebody can remake it. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. What's the worst thing for your car's interior? No, it's not that milkshake the kids spilled in the back seat. It's the sun. Harmful UV rays cook your automobile's interior hour after hour when it's parked outside, even on a cloudy day. What's the solution? Covercraft sunscreens. They protect your dash, seats, and interior finishes from those damaging UV rays while keeping the interior temperature tolerable even on the hottest summer days. No more painfully sizzling seats and steering wheels for you. They unfold quickly and easily install, stay where you put them, and are custom pattern for an exact fit. The foam core acts as a cooling insulator, and you can get yours in different colors and finishes. And they even fold up easily and store under your seat or on the floor. I've used Covercraft sunscreens for years and they are a fast and easy solution that protect my beloved cars when they're not in the garage. Learn more and order yours at Covercraft.com. Want to protect your entire vehicle? Get a car cover from Covercraft. They have those too. That's Covercraft.com. And tell them Mark sent you. Mark Green here. I'm a car care fanatic. You know that. And I've discovered Migliori Luxury Car Care Products. Migliori Strata Coating is a ceramic treatment that you can easily apply by yourself. It provides your special vehicle with a high gloss finish and lasts for over a year. Migliori Strata Coating features an extreme hydrophobic finish, so water sheets right away, reducing water spotting, and it makes your car washing a breeze. With over a 100 positive reviews on Amazon, this is a time-tested product that's made here in the USA. With fall and winter on the way, protect your vehicle's finish with Migliori. You'll find all their premium car care products at Migliori. MigliorIWax.com. Plus, you'll get 10% off at checkout by using the code CARS. Yeah, 10% off. What a deal. That's M I G L I O R E Wax.com. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. I'm revved up and so excited to introduce today's very special guest calling in from Waxhaw, North Carolina, Terry Shea. Hey, Terry, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? Absolutely. Looking forward to it, Mark. All right. We'll have some fun. Terry Shea is Hemmings Motor News Auction Editor and heads up a team of freelancers who are responsible for building the listings of the vehicles that are being offered at Hemmings Auctions. His career has included working in the media business at the Sporting News as a freelancer, then as a contributor to dozens of automotive magazines and websites, providing words and photography. Terry joined Hemmings in 2011 as an editor and contributed to their three magazines, Hemmings Motor News, which we all know is the Bible, Hemmings Classic Car, and Hemmings Muscle Machine, along with providing digital content for Hemmings.com. Along with meeting lots of fellow enthusiasts, collectors, and like-minded collectors, he also gets to drive a great number of vintage, antique, muscle, and exotic automobiles. I'm jealous. Terry, I've told our listeners just a little bit about you. Would you take a brief moment and share a little more about your career and a very obvious passion that you have? for automobiles. Well, for me, it got started like most folks as a kid. My father, who was a child of the Depression, grew up with his family, had a 36 Chrysler Airflow. And even as a kid, I knew the Airflow is the first aerodynamic car, the first unibody car, the first car where all the passengers were between the axles and all these great things about the car. And then he told me stories that his brothers and father were off uh, fighting World War II for the country. And he rebuilt the engine in that car in 1944, 1945 in the street in Brooklyn. So <laughs> cool. <laughs> that, you know, I was impressed, you know, 12 or 13 year old kid rebuilding the engine in the street. So that was, that was always an introduction that I got to cars and my father would take us to a few shows here and there. He wasn't really a collector. We couldn't really afford it. His brother had a 69 charger. So you can see the Mopar theme here. And his brother traded in a 56 Jaguar sedan on that 69 Charger, and it was either the 69 Charger or an Aston Martin. <laughs> so, Oh, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, my uncle. Well, you know, back then the British cars weren't so trustworthy, so uh, I can see why he may have done that. Yeah, and I grew up. A brother of mine was a big Mopar nut, and and really as a teenager he was a great mechanic. So my first car was a '69 Dodge Dart GT that I bought in the mid '80s. I paid 300 bucks for it, drove it home from a junkyard. And my brother looked at it, and the first thing he did was he stomped on the pedal and left a, a divot in the, my mom's driveway from when he did a burnout that lasted about 30 seconds and left a cloud of smoke over the neighborhood. <laughs> I was freaking out, of course, thinking that he was going to break something, but those old Mopars are pretty rugged. So hey, Where it all started. Well, that's cool, the Airflow. What a special car. I mean, that was a car way ahead of its time. Uh, I think part of the, the challenge that had was it was a little bit too far ahead of its time. And you go back and look at how it, it was kind of uh, oddly received by a lot of people, like, what is going on with this thing? But I think they're cool looking. Uh, I got to see one when I was at the California Automotive Museum uh, shooting an episode of Cars yeah! TV with their curator, Carly Starr. And she had a lot of great facts and history she shared with me that I didn't know about that car. So I think it's neat that that's part of your history. Well, as we continue on your journey, I want to ask you for a success quote or a mantra. This is some kind of saying that's been instrumental in forming your life and your success. It's a nice way to get the inspirational tire smoking like your brother did here on Cars. Yeah. So, Terry, take the wheel. I would say more than a quote or a saying is just to be resourceful. And actually, I look back to my father on that, too. My father, again, being a child of the Depression, he fixed everything. He wasn't a mechanic. He wasn't an electrician. He was a civil servant when I knew him he, in my life. He grew up working for the Department of Defense in contracts. So, you know, approving, I don't know, $900 toilet seats and $600 screwdrivers or whatever the, the, the accusation was 30 or 40 years ago. And if something broke, he fixed it. And his general philosophy was, if somebody made it, somebody can fix it or somebody can remake it. That resourcefulness, and it wasn't, he never gave speeches. He never gave talks. He just kind of led by example. So I think that that resourcefulness is something that I look to. And that might be a situation at work where there's a problem. And I guess we have options to take on that, which is, oh, it's not my problem. It's so-and-so's problem in that other department. Or, oh, the thing that's supposed to be waiting for me here, I need that. Well, I don't have that thing. So what can I do? How can I get my job done with the tools that I have before me? So that's something that I like to think I've always leaned on it. I've always been able to look inside and say, okay, what can I do with what I've got in front of me? Yeah, it's a great concept that your dad shared with you. Obviously, in journalism and the areas of expertise that you have in the automotive world, resourcefulness is definitely an asset. That's for sure, especially when you're writing about cars, learning about cars. And of course, these days, I'm going to talk a little bit about resources a little in the future, but it's so different now. You can find out so much information, but of course, you've got to make sure that it's well vetted and it's accurate because there's a lot of stuff out there that maybe isn't very accurate. You kind of alluded to this earlier. I want to go back in time and talk about a story that ignited this passion you have for cars and maybe that pivotal moment as you knew, you know what? I'm a car guy. As a kid, with my father talking about cars, he would, again, fixing everything. So my father brought home in the early 80s, like maybe 1981 or 82, a 200,000 mile Mercedes, a 71 Mercedes 280 SEL, I think they called the color Havana, the tobacco brown color, you know, 200,000 mile car was all but used up. But, you know, those old Mercedes, those uh, W108 chassis, those things will go for millions of miles. And he, he essentially restored it. He had never restored a car before. He'd done some work on other cars of my mother in his own car. Yeah, I think we had a Pinto. Yeah, I grew up with three older brothers. I was the youngest, and my father had a Pinto with a manual transmission with a four-speed, and it only sat five people. So when you're the little kid, you ride on the way back. My mother liked this Mercedes. He bought it, and he spent a few years putting it back together. I would help him. I didn't even know I was helping him. Hey, grab the, the wrench, you know, whatever size it was. Grab the 12 millimeter wrench. And, oh, that hose over there. Grab that, but only take a couple feet. Get the short one, and we'll cut it down. And you don't even realize you're learning some of these things. I am by no means, I think calling myself a hack mechanic would be a disservice to hacks and mechanics alike. But but again, you can, most things you can fix if you get to them. But that's, and again, it goes back to my dad again, that doing that with him. And then I used to build models as a kid. And I think it was a, a Lancia Stratos was one of the first model kits I bought. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. And of course, 40 years ago, there was no internet to look up and see what a Lancia Stratos was. So I go to the library and look at books. I actually looked at Hemmings. This, sound, this might sound a little amusing, but we were visiting relatives 
in the UK. My mother's from Ireland, and of course, of her generation, everyone left, and that meant going to Canada or Australia or the United States. So her brothers lived in the UK, and we visited. And my father visited the Jaguar factory with an older brother. I was much too young. He couldn't lie about my age like he did for my older brother. He had to be 16 to go. And when we came back, he had an interest in possibly getting a Jaguar Mark V. He was really interested in a Mark V. He ended up not doing it, but I remember the first issue of Hemings Motor News I got. I would look and I would see these ads. Yeah, I remember one in particular. It's a Jaguar Mark V, one of two from the factory with an XK engine. It was December, September 1982 issue. And I remember looking at it and thinking, what's the XK engine? What's that all about? And the ads, I would read it cover to cover and I would read the ads. And that was, that was an education for me. I would see 19, I remember very distinctly an ad, 1959 Imperial Crowns hardtop coupe, pillarless coupe. And I thought that was the most beautiful car I'd ever seen. I would read through Hemmings, read the pages, read the ads. And I'd learn these little things. You know, it might say 1971 Buick GS stage one, one of whatever number. I'd be like, oh, okay. Buick GS stage one is a rare car. And all these little things, just reading that magazine cover to cover. Nice, nice. Well, Hemmings, it seems like it's been around forever. And I guess in your case, it was around forever. But yeah, definitely is a education when you go through the pages of Hemmings. And that's why I mentioned at the beginning, all those of us in the car world call it the Bible because it has just about everything you need to know in there about cars. So I think I love it. It's fantastic. Well, let's take a look at some of the roads you've driven down throughout your career, your life, and talk about a big challenge or a failure. I like to bring this up, not so much that I like you to bring up something that might have been painful, but more so, what was the learning lesson here, and how did you come out on the other end in a positive way? Well, I would say something that was a challenge is that I did an internship at Car and Driver in college 30 years ago, and when I finished college, I started working for the sports magazine, first on the editorial side, and then it ended up on the business IT side. So I had started my career with an intent to be a journalist of sorts. Sports once I started working in it, it was slightly less appealing to me. I enjoyed being around it. I enjoyed sports. But I think the last time I cared about the outcome of a game was probably the, the first day I started or the night before I worked there. The 1991 World Series, I remember it very distinctly because Jack Morris had a 10-inning win in Game 7 against the Braves. I listened to it on the radio and it blew me away. And I think it's the last time I cared about the outcome of a sporting event. So in, those, in, in the bulk of the rest of the 10 years, the sporting news, I spent a lot of time on the, again, on the business side, the IT side, not on the, not on the journalism side, but I had never lost my passion for working in automotive journalism. For me, getting back into that, getting back into the writing and ultimately the photography side of it, then I had to start as a freelancer. So I started writing for club magazines. I had a lot of success with the BMW Car Club of America's Roundel magazine, which is probably one of the best car magazines for a club out there, professionally produced. It's one of the reasons a lot of folks remain in the club even after they sell their BMWs. That magazine started opening doors for me, and I started adding more magazines. I started meeting more people in the business, both on the publishing side and on the product communication side. I was doing mostly new cars at the time, some how-to stuff, but not necessarily mechanical how-to stuff, but buyer's guides, for instance, and I started adding a lot more uh, publishing clients while I was still doing IT work. And ultimately, I thought somewhere around 2008, things were really looking great. I had added a whole bunch more magazines. I was really growing my business. Then, of course, in 2008, when the economy imploded, the publishing industry was already taking it on the chin for years before that, between Google and then later Facebook and all of these online entities where people were getting their content for free and nobody wanted to pay for it anymore, and the ad dollars were running away in droves. Consolidation in the business had a lot to do with that. You had a handful of publishers buying up a lot of magazines. And once they start cannibalizing similar titles, the lesser titles will get neglected. And then ultimately, they would stop publishing them. So so I had worked toward this goal of really growing a great number of clients. And then it, most of it evaporated overnight. Even Hemmings was one of those. I had done some work for Hemmings. And Hemmings, to their credit, when they when they stopped hiring freelancers or shrunk that part of it, they made sure that they took care of their own employees, as opposed to a lot of other publications that were jettisoning employees in any journalism field, really, the last 15 years. It's been really tough. But I, I, again, I stuck it out and kept with it and eventually made a connection with some of the editors at Hemmings, and it, it worked out. 
then we moved the family to Vermont there eight years ago, which is a wonderful, wonderful place to live. There you go. You know, this is an interesting commentary here because I hear this more and more, although uh, car people are still buying magazines. I mean, you mentioned Roundell, a friend of mine who's the editor there, Satch Carlson. Oh, yeah. Uh, He's been a guest on the show here. Yeah, very interesting guy, very different guy. And you're right. That's one of those club magazines because I'm a member of a lot of car clubs and it's one of the better ones, I believe. Um, I also love the Porsche Panorama. I think it's a great publication. Another actually book, since they, yeah. they broadened it and made it, brought it back to a, a real size, as I say. And uh, it's, it's been redesigned and they do a really nice job with that. But a lot of the other ones, um, I struggle with sometimes. I, mean, I used to have 40 car magazine subscriptions and I don't have all those anymore. Uh, because so much of it, I would get them and just go, oh, I already know this. I've already seen this. Oh, uh, well, not much to read here. And you start to look at that and go, okay, that's a lot of money that that adds up to. Do I really, am I really reading these? And that's what it came down to. It wasn't even the money. It was just, am I really reading these anymore? Well, not really, because I'm getting all this information, like you say, for free online and, and transferring people to online magazines from written magazines, printed magazines, I should say. Uh, Seems to be a difficult things for a thing for publications to do. So, but it sounds like you went down the right path. You stuck by your guns and you got involved with a publication that's been around forever and continues to be around. And again, it's one of those things that our guys love Hemmings. Well, it's been 65 years now. And Hemmings, if we've got a moment here, has an interesting history. It started as a small newsletter out in Illinois. I believe the original publisher was Edward Hemmings. And there was essentially two sections, Model A and Model T. And then later you had Model A, Model T, and non-Ford. And Terry Eric, who was from Vermont, bought it in the 1960s and moved it to Vermont after a few years. And the growth was really exponential because it was the only national marketplace. And Hemmings was about 98% classified, a handful of letters, stolen car alerts, event notifications. But about 15, 16 years ago, after American City Business Journals, which is Hemming's parent company today, bought the company from Terry Eric's heirs, he he passed away and his family sold the business to ACBJ with one giant caveat, and that was to keep the magazine, the majority of employees based in Vermont. And it really is in Bennington. I mean, it's it's the big town in Bennington County, and it's maybe 12,000 people. You know, there's not... Everything in Vermont is small. I mean, there's no... The biggest city in the whole state is 30,000 people. So it was a, it's an important part of the community there, and it's an important part of the car hobby, as you mentioned. With Hemmings Motor News, they've added a whole editorial section in the front of the book now, so it's not just classified. It's all this original editorial being produced, and ACBJ also invested, and we started publishing Hemmings Classic Car and Muscle Machine. So it's really been a good thing for the company, and it's really grown into not just a giant classified book, but a well-respected automotive publication as well. So that's been been great to be a part of that. It's been really enjoyable. Fantastic. Well, let's talk about your first really special vehicle. You talked about that car that your uh, brother stomped on the gas pedal with, but I'm interested in the first car that really meant something to you, something really special. Maybe it was that vehicle and share a memory you have about that ride. The Dart GT to me was special because in the mid 80s, Cars really weren't that exciting. So, and the Dart GT is not really a muscle car. It was the luxury version of the Dart. It did have a V8. It had a two barrel, 273 V8. So the small Chrysler V8 with a two barrel. But again, with my brother's connections, we put a bigger two barrel on it. We put headers and glass packs on it. So of course, it made a lot of noise. And I never had the car registered, but I would I would go out and drive it once in a while. I'd take a plate off one of his cars. I think he had a 70 Dart that was yellow. I don't think we would have fooled the police much on that one. But, you know, I'd drive it a little bit and and tool around in it. Nothing too outrageous. I did sell that to another brother when I went to college. But it's funny because even though I started as a Mopar guy, as soon as I started driving European cars and sporty cars, rather than thinking of quarter mile times or that glass pack sound, I started looking at lighter cars and how they handled. So the first car in that vein was a 1986 GTI that I bought in college. I may have, maybe, I guess the statute of limitations is up, but I might've used the student loan to buy that one. We won't tell anybody. I think I bought some wheels with my student loan. And that, that was a fun car. So the GTI, I buy at a really good price on it. You get alloy wheels and disc brakes and sports seats, a close ratio, five speed. It was only a hundred horsepower, maybe 105. I don't remember exactly what it was. Fuel injected 
And, you know, 60 series, 14 inch tires. Hey, you know, those were the low profiles back in the day. And that car was a hoot. It was fun. I could put three friends in it. We could tool around. I got, I drove cross country, got 37, 38 miles to the gallon at 70 miles an hour. I mean, that car was really, that really opened my eyes to the sort of high RPM, sticky tire, tight handling car, more of a European sports car. And I've had an awful lot of, I've been lucky. I've had a lot of fun cars over the years. Not always the smartest decision, but certainly the fun one. So I've had, I had several Volkswagens of that generation. I had a, a BMW M3, the E30 M3 that I probably bought at the lowest price they ever were. And I drove the snot out of it for a couple of years. I, I'm not the greatest wheelman. I think I'm okay, but that car you could get sideways, dial it back in. It was so forgiving, such tight handling. I mean, it leaked like the Exxon Valdez. I mean, every, every other week I was, plugging another hole in it. There was something leaking in the thing all the time, but it was so much fun. You'd rev the snot out of the engine. But that was a good time. So I've had a I've had a variety of uh European sports cars since having that Dart GT back in the day. Nice, nice. Well the GTI, great car. My first new car was the seventy nine Scirocco. So the well, first generation of the Scirocco, which is a fantastic car. I love that car. I had it for about ten years, I think, and sold it to a neighbor. So they're fantastic. Is there one of these special cars you've had that you sold that you have some seller's remorse about that you wish you still had? You know, in my work with Hemmings and meeting these car owners, you run into that a lot, which is why a lot of guys go back and buy the car they let go. But I have to be honest with you, not really. I'm I'm a big believer in you sell it and let it go and you cut the cord. I kind of have a rule about cars. So those G so I had a GTI and I had two GLIs of the same generation. My feeling is once you leave that car, you can't go back to it. If I go yeah. back, but I might. A good, think, it's a good way to think of it. You know, you don't end up like the the other one thousand four hundred plus guests I've had that have a tear in their eye, including me. Cars that I wish I hadn't let go, but uh, I think you're right. Now you said you had a GLIs as well, the Jettas. Yeah, I had an eighty five GLI, which was probably the nicest one of the bunch. It was a it was a great little car. You know, the same kind of thing. I did autocross with it. It would put one wheel in the air. It looked like it's going to flip. And then I had a two liter sixteen valve GTI in ninety one with the hot engine and bigger wheels and the nice Recaro interior. And that's where I got my you can't go back rule because I had had other cars in between. I had the M3 and I had a Porsche 968 in between. And I was like, I'm going to dial back. I got to save a few bucks here. And I should have known the guy I bought it from had had the wheels replaced under insurance. I think he had just curbed the wheels and that just kind of showed how he treated it. But I had these Borbet type C wheels and I always wanted that generation Jetta GLI with the Borbet Type C wheel. And it turns out he was kind of rough on the car. And, and that was where I made my mistake. I went back and it, it wasn't the same. It was a problem. It was a fun car when it worked, but it, it had yeah. way too many issues for me. Well, I was going to say, my wife and I, uh, we just celebrated our 35th wedding anniversary. And the first car we bought new the year we got married, 84, was a GLI. And uh, it was a great car. And we had our first child with that car. So it was a nice little family car. I uh, babied that thing, took really good care of it. We took a lot of road trips in that car, driving from San Diego to Utah to go skiing in Northern California and Arizona and so forth. So they are fun cars. Uh, they were great. You know, not super fast, but you felt like you're in a little kind of a tight sports car, that European feel that you were talking about. So I love those cars. Yeah. So we share some some car history here together. I would love for you to talk a bit about what has you excited and fired up these days about Hemmings and also uh, this division that you work in here with the uh, Hemmings Motor News Auctions. Well, thanks for asking, Mark. Hemmings Auctions is a new venture for the company. Again, we're 65 years old, but Hemmings, it took a while, but we've been online for a good long time now. So Hemmings Auctions is essentially adding another avenue for people to sell their car and find another enthusiast buyer, another person in the hobby to buy that car. So we've had the classifieds in the magazine for years. It's still going strong. It still is probably, I think I can can say with pretty good authority, it's probably the best national marketplace. We have plenty of international readers too for classic cars. We have Hemmings online, Hemmings.com, where a lot of those cars are also advertised. And online, you get to put a lot more pictures. You can put a video. You can do a bigger description. And Hemmings auctions is one step more. So with Hemmings Auction, a person can submit a car and we do select the cars. We're looking for cars. We're not looking for cars that are going to set auction records. We're not looking for projects. We're not looking for used cars, the kind of car, you know, you got a five-year-old 
Grand Cherokee, well, you know, probably the classifieds are sell that locally. That's more of a used car. We're looking for enthusiast cars that people can use. We love the idea that people can use their cars. We're not looking, again, we're not looking for number one Concorde cars, but we're not looking for beaters either. So it's a venue for people to sell their cars. We can promote it in a certain way more than we can our regular ads. And honestly, there's a lot, there's a surprising amount of excitement to it. So we had a 1958 Apache that went over the block today. And this truck, and the, the owner took a wonderful picture. They're from uh, the Ozarks in Missouri. They took a picture of this truck out in a the field. There's cows in the background and clouds over it. It's this bright red, the Apache spear on the side of it. And the bidding just kept going. We have anti-sniping software. So if you've ever bid on anything on eBay, a lot of people wait to the last two seconds and put in their bid, hoping that they'll they'll sneak it in there. But we have added software so that in the last five minutes, somebody bids, it adds two more minutes to the clock. And this went on for almost an hour and a half today. We couldn't get anything done. We're watching this thing. It kept going up. These two guys were were going at it. They wanted that truck. And, and you know, they'd wait the clock to get down to 10 seconds. They'd hit it. And it would, you'd see the screen flash and a bid came in. And it's actually pretty exciting. And the fun thing in this that I really like is today I said, this is a win-win-win. It's a win for the bidder because he got that clearly one of these, both of these guys wanted the truck. You know, he called the other guy's bluff eventually and biz Jim, I'm not sure where he's from, uh, but he, he won the truck and the seller got a great price for it. And Hemmings did well too. We take 5% of the sale as a buyer's fee with a maximum of $10,000 and a minimum of $500. And we have no other buyer's commission beyond that fee we take. There's no seller's commission. So a lot of auctions, there's a seller's commission on the back end. Most live auctions, you pay between 10 and 12% uh, as a buyer's commission. And the, the seller's commission is usually negotiable depending on the value of the vehicle. But it can be as much as 20% you know, on, on both ends when you count the buyer and the seller's commission. So Hemmings Auctions is yet another option for our customers that have cars that are going to have some buzz, have cars that are going to have... You know, it's funny... We first started looking at this, it was kind of like wide appeal, but sometimes narrow appeal, but broad reach is nice. We had an Amphicar go across the blocks this week, and it sold for a nice price. And the great thing about it is the guy who won the auction years and years ago, 50 years ago, he worked on the docks in Jacksonville, and he remembered unloading Amphicars that were shipped from Germany, which I think is really neat. Now he finally gets to have one. And and you know the funny thing is, Amphicars have swim-ins, not not drive-ins or cruise-ins, but swim-in. Right? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah Where they absolutely. gather and they you know float around <laughs> the lake and whatnot. So so Hemmings Auctions is another option option for people to sell their cars. It's not without risk, but we do have we allow our sellers to set a reserve. We have both private sellers and what we call our dealer partners that we've been working at with Hemmings for years. We had one of the first cars we sold. In fact, it was the first car we auctioned was by Auto Memories there in Marietta, Georgia. And the owner of that company has been selling through Hemmings since the early 60s. He may have had a different name at the time. And this is one of the great things about Hemmings, working as an editor, now working on the auction side, is the kind of doors it opens in the hobby. This fellow with Auto Memories decided, hey, I've been working. I've had such good luck with Hemmings over the years. I'm going to change my auction to no reserve. So in the middle of the auction, he went to no reserve. He wanted us to start out on the right foot and start out with a sale. And you know, that that as weird as it sounds, I mean, this is a money business, what we're in here. I mean, you know, people are buying and selling cars. They're they're buying and selling passion and, and their hobby. But uh, that, that's kind of touching. We were We were kind of moved that he would step up and do that. And in the middle of the auction, he said, take it to no reserve. And that's a really good omen to start with selling your first car. But people want to set a reserve to protect themselves. We certainly allow that too. And we negotiate that. We want to make sure that the bidder, the seller is realistic. You know, a lot of people feel really strongly and attached to these cars and they may feel a little stronger about what it's worth, or they see an auction result that might be an anomaly. You know, uh, the auction results can vary quite a bit depending on the venue, depending on the vehicle, depending on the condition. So we try to give them a range of what we think it's worth and what's a safe reserve. And that way we'll protect them, but it's also realistic that they will sell the car. Fantastic. Where do people go to get involved in Hemmings Auctions? I'm glad you asked. It's Hemmings.com slash auction. If you go to the main Hemmings site, there is a link to the auctions. And we've already, in the, in the few weeks we've been live, it's been about three weeks now, 
we've already made some changes. We've added a tag that tells the bidders if the reserve has been met or not. We've made it easier to find the completed auctions so that people can go back and look. We won't delete any of that. We'll keep that up so people can go back and research it and say, oh, I remember that 58 Chevrolet Apache. That did really well a few months ago or a few years ago. And they can go and search and find that so people can get back to that. Very cool. I love it. We'll make sure we put a link to that on Terry's show notes page on the Cars Yeah website. Check it out. So Terry, up next is the last lap. Before we put the pedal to the metal, let's say thank you to today's Cars Yeah sponsors. When you want proven performance, there's one brand that's been around since 1938. That's Edelbrock, building the finest American-made performance products for the street and track. Edelbrock's products are designed and dyno-proven to deliver maximum results. Edelbrock has thousands of made-in-the-USA performance products for all makes and models. From their new AVS2 carburetor and innovative ProFlow 4 EFI for your muscle car or truck. To superchargers for your daily driver and more, visit edelbrock.com to check out the latest products for your ride and when you're ready to check out enter cars yeah in the coupon code and get 10 percent off your order that's edelbrock automotive performance since 1938 you take care of your cars but who takes care of your investments tune-ups aren't just for engines updating your financial plan is important too your gps may take you from a to b but it won't help you on the road to financial freedom. For that, you need a good co-pilot and a very trusted advisor. Chris Kimball, CFP, is just the man for the job. He'll guide you down that road without driving you crazy. For over 25 years, Chris has helped people just like you and me with their financial planning and investments. With a master's degree in financial services, he is eminently qualified, and he's a car guy too. Learn more at chrisvkimball.com. Or call 866-ON-A-PLAN. Securities through Money Concepts Capital Corp. Member FINRA SIPC. CK Financial Services is not affiliated with Money Concepts Capital Corp. Are you looking for a way to get your products or services into the ears of thousands of automotive enthusiasts around the globe? I can help. This is Mark Green here at Cars Yeah. And I'd be honored to be an influencer and ambassador for your brand in a unique and personal way. Five days a week, thousands of subscribers and listeners enjoy the Cars Yeah podcast and website. Contact me today and I'll show you how at mark at carsyeah.com or connect with me through the Cars Yeah website at carsyeah.com. Okay, Terry, we are back and I have a bit of an introspective question for you. I'm going to kind of get into your head a little bit here. If you woke up tomorrow and you were manifested as a vehicle, not what you want to be, but how you perceive yourself, as a car, truck, or motorcycle, what would Terry be and why? Wow, that that's an interesting one. It's somewhere between a mini and a stretch limo. Um, let me think about <laughs> that's, that. <laughs> that's um, a, a large range you've got us going here. Well, it's funny. I would probably be something like an old Ford Bronco, like a pre-OJ Bronco, like the early Ford Bronco. I had one of those two at one time. And even though I'm not into sport utility vehicles all that much, it goes back to that resourcefulness and the get it done kind of thing. I might not be able to carry a huge load, but I'm going to get through it in all in all conditions. I'll be able to get through it and figure my way around it. It might not be super fast, but it'll get done. I think that's probably a close enough vehicle. Might be a little rickety too. <laughs> Nicely said. I like the way you thought that through. All right, we are entering the last lap. I'm going to fire off a series of questions for you and ask you to give our listeners some quick blips of that pre OJ. Like the way he's pre-OJ Bronco, yeah. Everybody knows the OJ Bronco. Yeah, well, he didn't do much for the reputation of that vehicle, that's for sure. Uh, Throttle, and here we go. What's the best automotive advice you've ever received? I would say when buying a car, know exactly how much you're going to spend before you ever negotiate. Because if you think, eh, I'll spend around $15,000, you are going to walk out of there for no less than $20,000. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Know your number, especially at an auction, for sure. Would you share one of your personal habits you believe has contributed to your many successes over the years? I would say speak up because Hmm. no one is going to listen to you and no one is going to offer you anything if you don't ask them for it. Yes. Uh, Yeah. Where were you when I was in high school? I had a lot more dates if I thought that way. (laughs) Speak up and ask more girls out. I I know I would have had more dates. I don't know if I'm saying that now. Is is my wife listening to this? (laughs) Wait. Hold on. Well, yeah, my, my wife either. No, so uh, now that's not for now, dear. 
That was for back then. How about a resource? I have a feeling you've got a great resource for our listeners to uh, tap into. Well, I would actually say join a car club. We were talking before about about the BMW car club, and I've had BMWs on and off for the last, wow, 25 years now. I still have one in the garage. Even in the years I was didn't have a BMW, I stayed in the club. Great people, met great friends there, and there are a lot of car clubs that cater to every shape and size and mark and make and model and year, and it's a good way to meet like-minded people. It's a good way to find resources if you need help, so join a car club. Absolutely. And of course, one of my favorites is HemmingsMotorNews.com. That's a good one, too. There you go. Now, if I could arrange for you to sit down and have a drink with anyone in the automotive industry, living or deceased, who would it be? It would probably be Ettore Bugatti. And I don't know if we'd really say anything, but maybe we would just sit around drinking a cocktail and admiring the things he created. (laughs) That might be it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, that would be interesting. Have you been to the Champ Museum? In France? I have, and it is fantastic. Even as a kid, I read about the Schlumps, and I thought it was the most amazing story in the world that these two textile magnates would decide to corner the world market on Bugatti. I know. But that was incredible, huh? Yeah, it's an incredible place. I was fortunate enough to visit years ago, and I'd love to go back. Absolutely. Uh, I just uh, did an interview uh, with David Granger. He was my 1400th guest, and uh, two days after the interview, uh, he was off to France and Europe, and he actually is going to do a special visit with them and get to uh, do some behind the scenes with them. So I was a little bit jealous. I'd like to have joined him with that. How about a book, Terry? Is there a book that you've read that you think our listeners should read? One of my favorite automotive books, uh, it's about 30 years old, maybe 31 years old. It's called Racing the Silver Arrows by Chris Nixon. And it is about the auto union versus Mercedes Grand Prix battles of the 1930s. And he conducted this, or wrote, okay, back. He wrote the book based on interviews with survivors, family members, and widows, because a lot of these people didn't make it out of the decade, the racers back then. And each chapter for each year during the time when Hitler was financing Grand Prix racing in Germany, first auto union and later Mercedes Benz, he interviews or has a story about one of the players, whether it's the driver, team principals, and their story along with what happened that year. And it is a fantastic glimpse into racers' lives during that period, the racing itself, the battle between mainly the German rivals, but also the occasional French or Italian competition. And the British really had nothing in that era. But it's a fantastic book, Racing the Silver Arrows by Chris Nixon. It's been republished a couple of times since, but it's a book worth finding. Fantastic. I'll make sure I put a link to where you can go find such a book on Terry's show notes page. All right, Terry, we're up to the checkered flag. This last question can be a bit of a doozy. Today, I'm going to buy you any cool collector car on the planet. doesn't matter where it is or who it belongs to. I'm going to park it in your garage. But of course, there's some strings attached. One is it's the only collector car you can have. You have to drive it. No garage queens around here. And you can't sell it to buy a bunch of other toys with. So what can I buy you? Well, I'm going to assume since money is no object, I've got a team to make. Oh, yeah. No problem. <laughs> and I'm always I'm always a fan of when I ask people. I've asked this question to other folks as part of my job. What's your dream car? And I always tell people, dream big. Don't tell me uh, a new Accord with the latest stereo system and leather interior. That's not a dream. That's just being comfortable. So for me, it would be a Bugatti. And I would say Bugatti Type 35 Grand Prix car. Ooh. And again, as, uh, long as, I've got, yeah. as long as I've got all the money in the world and somebody can take care of it and I turn the key and hop in it, it works. Yeah, that'll work for me. I don't need a roof. I don't need, apparently, you know, Bugatti apparently didn't believe in brakes either, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> that would yeah, do it for me. For sure. But, Oh, beautiful car. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because I mentioned earlier, my wife and I just celebrated our 35th wedding anniversary. And I did a little thing on Facebook with a Bugatti Type 35 since it was 35 years. Uh, Of course, I had to make our anniversary into something car related. Makes my wife roll her eyes, but I think she was happy with it. But uh, that car is beautiful. Love those cars. Love everything about those cars. Uh, they're stunning. So I'd be happy to find you a beautiful Bugatti Type 35. Terry, you've taken me on a fun ride today. I want to thank you for calling in and sharing your stories. And uh, thanks for everything you and your team there do at Hemmings. Uh, We all have enjoyed it for years and will continue to. 
Is there a little parting piece of wisdom or guidance you might offer me before you drive off into the sunset in that Type 35? One of the things I like to tell people, I'm often asked, what's a good car to invest in? And I think you want to invest, I would say, an S&P 500 index fund. I don't even know what that is, but I've heard that's a great thing to invest in. But don't look at a collector car as an investment. Look at it as a source of joy. Because if you think of it as an investment, you will put it in the garage. You will be afraid to drive it. And we like to think that we're in the business of connecting people with something fun, something they're passionate about. And I don't know about you, but I'm not particularly passionate about S&P 500 index funds or index funds nah, of any kind. Of boring. Yeah. They really are. <laughs> so, so buy a car that you like. And hey, if the value goes up or if the value goes down, it's not going to be worth nothing when you go to sell it. Maybe you get a few years out of it. A different car catches your fancy. You sell it and put that into another car. Call it invest if you'd like. But buy what you like. Don't try to make money on it. Buy what you like yeah. or what you love for that matter. Yeah, because if you get stuck with it, at least you have something you love. What's the best way for our listeners to follow along with you and all your teammates there at Hemmings Motor News? Well, you can get a subscription to the magazine where I've still got a column where I write about the silly adventures I have, as well as some of my other colleagues and the stories we cover. So one of our three magazines or Hemmings.com. You can sign up for our daily newsletter where we provide the latest news on the collector car hobby. And if you got something to buy or to sell or you're looking to buy in a car, Hemmings Auctions, I would definitely recommend that. Absolutely. I'll make sure I put links to all these on Terry's show notes page. Just go to carsyeah.com, type in Terry Shea, S-H-E-A, the spelling of his last name, and that page will pop right up. I'd like to do a shout out to Kurt Ernst for introducing me to Terry. Thank you, Kurt, for putting us together. It's how I meet a lot of the people that I have on the show here. Terry, thanks for being so generous today with your time and expertise and for sharing your experiences with our listeners, not only here, but of course on Hemmings, because you guys share an awful lot of great information there. Until you and I talk again, I'll see you down the road. Thanks so much, Mark. It's been an honor being on your show. You're welcome. Hey, Mark Green here from Cars Yeah. Did you know you can now see me on the Cars Yeah TV show? It's a weekly visit to some of my past Cars Yeah podcast guests, and I take you along for the ride. You go behind the garage door and into their lives, their businesses, and you get to see what makes them successful. With tens of millions of viewers, Cars Yeah TV is making its mark. Cars Yeah TV is available on MAV TV and Lucas Oil Racing TV. You'll find MAV TV on Direct TV. Fubo TV, Fios by Verizon, or you can stream it through Lucas Oil Racing Television online. And they said I only had a face for podcasting. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!